So, hello everyone, welcome to the last session on um, UFS updates, cloud computing infrastructure and computational performance. We've had some great talks in the first days and um, I'm looking forward to a couple more. So you've got 10 minutes and as I said, warning after six minutes, two minutes to wrap up and then at eight minutes we'll stop it and take some questions. All right, uh, so the first speaker is Min Suk from EMC, and he's going to talk about testing frameworks towards unified UFS system. Okay, take it from there, Min Suk. Okay, thank you, Dom. So today I'm going to talk about the testing framework that's being used by the UFS weather model and the UFS S2S model. So by testing framework, I mean uh, different files, uh, data, uh, the data directories and the overall workflow used to uh, make sure that code changes coming into the UFS repositories, they do not break any existing code base. And the testing framework can also serve as a useful environment and tool that developers can use in their implement, build, test, debug cycle, because they provide the build, uh, build interface as well as predefined test cases that they can use in their development. In the UFS weather model, the regression test is the main component of the testing framework. And it includes a number of uh, small, simple shell scripts and related configuration files. And it calls a top level build script that interfaces with either GNU make or CMake build system. There are currently about 70 tests, and we make sure that all of those 70 tests pass before any pull requests into the repository is merged. On the UFS sub-seasonal to seasonal model side, uh, there have recently been many changes that required adding new tests. And we have transitioned from the old NEMS CompSat run system to the new framework that is identical to the one used by the weather model. We also change, uh, update the top level build script from the NEMS app builder to compile.sh. Um, I can think of two reasons for this change. Uh, the first is the maintainability and the, um, the availability of the support for the testing framework. And the second is that as we move towards uh, unifying the weather model and the S2S model, this is a step in the right direction for having a common testing framework for the unified system. So for the UFS S2S model, there are currently 16 tests and they, uh, they are supported on platforms uh, Hera, Orion, and WCOS Dell phase three. So let me give you a brief overview of the regression test and some, some examples. So the regression test root directory is UFS S2S model slash test. And RT.sh is the main script, which calls a number of other scripts. So on the build side, it calls compile.sh, which calls the GNU make file. On the testing side, it calls the run test.sh, which basically sets up the environment variables. And then it calls the rtfv3.sh, which prepares a canned case in the run directory. The rtutils.sh basically contains a number of utility functions. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, there are a number of input slash configuration files that you need to provide. And the first one, you, you see that um, there's a test name file under UFS S2S model slash test slash test. So basically this test name file, you can think of as the entry point or um, entry point where it, it, defines, uh, it defines the self-contained test case. And rt.conf, if you want to run multiple test cases, you, you put those multiple test cases in the rt.conf and rt.shell will be able to run all of them. And there are some other files that defines the default values for name list variables and set up the initial conditions. Uh, so as I mentioned, the test name file defines the self-contained complete test case that developers can test, take and run. 
Uh, if you want to run a single task, you invoke this uh, this command shown in the middle, uh, basically minus n followed by test name. And if you're a developer, you're implementing new physics, and you need to add a test case that goes with your development, then you need to add a similar test case, test name files. And as a starting point, you can look at the UFS SFS model slash test slash test. You can take a look at some of the other test name files, and you can uh, start from there. And if you want to build and run all tests, because there are so many tests and it takes a long time to run them, we have a workflow manager such as the EC flow and recorder managers uh, that you can use to shorten the computational time. Um, if you rather build it uh, yourself instead of rt.sh calling the compile.sh, you can specify different build options. You can specify what kind of components you want to include, MOM6, CI, uh, WaveWatch 3, CMAPs, and et cetera. And if you want more information, you can refer to the S2S model wiki page shown in these links. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about what we call the pull request test or PR test. This is a, a feature that we recently implemented in the weather model, uh, whereas the, the full regression test is very costly in terms of computational resources and time. The PR test, it only runs a single test. So it's similar to running rt.shell with minus n flag, but the difference is that it has many other, what we call the unit test. So unit test, uh, uh, okay. So unit test is more like, um, it's not, conventional unit tests in the software uh, industry, like you test the simple functions or subroutines or anything like that. It's more like an integration test or regress regression test. Basically, it tests that your code is thread sheet safe, NPI is safe, it, uh, it can handle different domain decompositions, it has a restart capability, it can build and run in debug mode and different precisions and things like that. Um, so developer, from the developer's point of view, they don't need to run, I mean, they could, but they don't need to run all different test cases. They want to pick up uh, the test case that is most relevant to their their development, and they want to check uh, all these different unit tests pass before they make a pull request. So these are some of the examples. Uh, you can pick selected unit tests. For example, if you just want to restart and thread, you can see uh, in the second row, uh, you can do specify RST comma thread. You, that will just test the unit test for restart and threading. And more information is available uh, in this link shown here. Uh, there have been some recent updates, so the link will be updated uh, in the future, in the near future. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is the continuous integration, which is a practice where developers check in their codes frequently. Uh, sometimes it's many times a day and build and tests are automated and based on the test results, improvements to the code are made. For UFS system, uh, there is a high requirement, large requirement for computational resource and time, so this is not an option. I mean, the developers can uh, build and test many times locally on their machines, but at the repository level, this is not possible, so the conventional uh, conventional definition of CI does not apply for the UFS system. But our our purpose for this continuous integration is to help the repository code managers screen out pull requests that do not meet certain criteria. And this might become more important as more community developers contribute to the UFS uh, open repositories. The continuous integration, it uses a PR test, um, which uh, which is good because it, it can find out the problems earlier in the stage uh, rather than later. So we use GitHub Actions, uh, GitHub Actions that allows us to automate our uh, custom workflow. So when there's a pull request to the UFS weather model repository, automatically build and PR tests are triggered. And build and tests are done in the cloud using Docker container based on the Linux image and the GNU toolset. And right now, the test runs in the cloud uh, using GitHub provided uh, uh, GitHub provided containers with a very limited amount of resources, like two cores and seven gigabytes of RAM. And the plan is to use the AWS in the future. 
and I attached some screenshots that shows the the how the pull request pull request is automatically tested by the GitHub Actions, and what are different jobs the different jobs in the GitHub Actions it builds into Docker images and then subsequently used by the test uh, procedure. And in the future, we might consider Jenkins for full re full regression tests on NOAA machines. And if you have any experience with Jenkins in NOAA network, we would like to hear from you because we have some security issues. That's All it, right. thank so you very I much. I think we need to wrap it up. Great, thanks very much. Um, while we transition to the next speaker, um, can you please unshare Minsook? Maybe Tina, you can read out one of those questions, please. Yeah, sure. Um, by Philip Pijan, it says, are there plans to check runtime and memory footprints for any code updates? For example, some new code doesn't slow down the existing model. Uh, I'm not aware of any plans. Um... All right, so please, um, we can answer the, the other questions. Oh, there's one more from Lisa um, online afterwards or while we're going. Um, so the next speaker is um, Tom Robinson talking about an overview of the FMS and how to contribute to it. Take it from there, please. <laughs> okay, yes. So I'll be talking about uh, the flexible modeling systems, which uh, is abbreviated FMS. Uh, FMS um, runs underneath MOM6 and FV3. So it is a part of the UFS system in that it runs the communications and the IO for those models. Uh, the FMS began a long time ago in 1998. Um, it was developed to support different uh, physics and different dynamical cores and, and different models in general. So it's supposed to be flexible in that it can support many different component models. Um, and the way that it's set up is basically there's a, a user code that's built on top of the FMS infrastructure code. So there's a, it, within the FMS code, there's a machine layer which does handles the communications and setting up the domains and uh, setting doing the IO and stuff like that. Above that, there's a layer that we refer to as the abstraction layer, which is basically an interface for users to um, use different uh, components within FMS that call the machine layer. So the actual modic component layer doesn't have to worry about doing any of the communication doesn't have to handle any of the IO. They call the abstraction layer and the abstraction layer does that for them. Uh, there is some C in the code, but it is mostly written in Fortran also. <clears throat> so this goes over a, a lot of what I just mentioned. Um, the FMS handles the MPI communications, the IO, it does errors, it handles the exchange grids. So exchanging between different grids like the tripolar or a cube sphere grid it's set up to do the exchanges between them. Um, it also has a diagnostic manager. It has a, a data override. It has uh, clocks. It does tracer management. Um, some of that I'll mention later on too. So the way that we handle our code is uh, it's hosted on GitHub. So you can go to our GitHub page and uh, you can fork it yourself and contribute to it. The code releases are done on a uh, with the first four digits being the year that they're released, and then the next two digits are the release number, and then the next two digits are a minor release number. So uh, it's not related to the month. So 2019-01 was released in December of 2019. Uh, and then we've been patching, we patched 2019. So we have a 2019.01.03. So that's how we're doing our releases. Um, and some of the code now is using 2019.0103. We are working on releasing a 2020.03 soon. Uh, the code is managed by the group that I'm a part of, which is the Modeling Systems Division at GFDL. Um, and we have a, an entire group uh, that's set up when everyone is an expert in some subset of the code. And there's a code owner's file that you can look at to see who exactly would be reviewing any uh, pull requests or anything that you might have. Those experts do all of the pull requests. And we have one main manager, his name Colin. He does all of the merges and he does the releases and stuff like that. Uh, if there's any problems or inquiries about code that's, on, that's in FMS, we handle it on the GitHub page. We monitor the issues very closely. 
Uh, a lot of us in modeling systems have, you know, we get emails whenever you guys open an issue. Uh, and we are converting the, the, so GitHub announced that they are converting master branch to main branch. And we will also be converting our main development branch to be called main in the near future. I think uh, we're shooting for September to actually convert from master to main. <clears throat> so there's a contribution guideline. Uh, it's definitely worth reading over. If you have comments, they should be in Doxygen style, for example. So if it's your first time um, contributing to the, to the project, make sure you read this over, at least gloss it over so that you know the kind of style that we're looking for within the code. Looking at the code itself and trying to mimic what's in there is a terrible idea. We came up with style guidelines, so our code doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, like using keywords as uh, variable names, we're trying to avoid that now, but in the past that did happen. So uh, looking at the code as an example is not the best way to do it. Look at the guidelines, the style guidelines, okay. And the way that we do our development and our pushes are, uh, we ask that you fork the repository yourself, you create a branch in the fork, and then you push to your own fork, and then you create a pull request back to the main trunk of the NOAA GFDL FMS repository. Um, so you don't actually make a branch in the NOAA FMS repository. And all of your pull requests must be accompanied by an issue. If you don't have an issue with it, um, then you'll get a comment on your pull request that says, please create an issue for this pull request. <clears throat> uh, and the pull requests all have temp the issues and the pull requests have a template that you fill out. There's check boxes. Make sure you check all of the boxes. This is something that's come up recently. You have to check the, all of the boxes, even if they don't apply to your pulls. Um, and we review all the updates. So we at least one person, sometimes more than one person, goes through, looks at the code, makes sure it updates. It also goes through uh, the continuous integration. Right now, we have continuous integration running on Travis. So it, it passes Travis CI tests. And then, um, and then uh, we also will test your code before we do a release. We test it with NOAA GFDL supported models. So we run it through our, our climate model suite. Uh, we have a, a couple, CM4, AM4, Spear, Shield, uh, a whole bunch of different models get run with it. Oh, I'm at six minutes. Two minutes, here. Tom. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so I just want to go over some of the um, the modules that are in FMS real quick. I'll probably kind of skip through this. I, I left these slides in here so that there's information. If you want to look back at the pre presentation when it's uh Later, you know, this information will be in there. But MPP is the machine layer, is what we refer to as the machine layer of the code. It does the communications. It sets up the domains for computation. Uh, the IO, there's MPP IO, and there is an FMS IO, a newer IO, but that's all still in the machine layer. There are clocks available for timing, and there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so MPP sets up lists for your cores and how many cores uh, and, and so basically it sets up like a list for the atmosphere and a list for the um, ocean and a list for the land. And it handles the communications between the different lists. Uh, and it also um, handles the communications uh, for uh, doing halo updates and stuff like that and collectives. Uh, it sets up the domains. So if you run a C96 uh, run on FV3, with a layout of 4.4, this is what the cores look like that are laid out over the 96 by 96 domain. Um, and there's just some other features here. Uh, the, the new IO is set up to mimic kind of what NetCDF is doing. And this is how the IO layouts are set up if you want to look back at this. Again, I put this in here for information purposes uh, to look back at later as a reference. And uh, this is just some of the other stuff that's in there. Um, this is, I have one more slide after this. So this is just uh, a list of other things like handling diagnostics and handling tracers and handling open MP. Uh, there's a time manager. You can override data at any point in your model run. And that's about it. I'm sorry I went through that really quick, but like I said, I put that in there, uh, most of that in there for reference purposes for the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tom. Thanks for staying in time. Um, as of now, I don't see any questions. I don't see any either. All right, and even worse, so I don't see our next speaker in the list unless Kevin is hiding under 
different Neymar has sent a substitute. If not, uh, I think we just move on to Brian and then hopefully Kevin will come back later. Certainly no troubles with that, unless there's folks that we think will arrive at 1230 or some such thing. But that's right. If course. you say, to play, so do you, what do you think? Press on or have a 10 minute gap? I think it's, this is Lou Wicker. I, I, I'm all for moving on, but I think actually the 10 minute gap makes more sense. Philip just mentioned that this will be recorded, so um, we can move on. And that yeah. oh, very good, very good. Record. That's a good point. Thanks, Phil, for that suggestion. Well, then that is exactly what we shall do. Right, thanks. So it's the next speaker is Brian Etherton talking about FV3 and AWS successes and challenges. Oh, Floor sorry. Is can you still see the presentation? We see it, um, yeah, in your PowerPoint with the thumbnails. All now good. we see the full screen. Great. And there we go. Thanks very well. Much. Well, very well then. I am Brian Etherton, and I get the I get to present to you today the work that has gone on in Maxar. I will say that my collaborators that are listed below, Stefan, Chris, and Travis, all equals, all all four of us contributed equally to the work that you're about to see presented by me. So about a year ago, Maxar of course, where the, the four of us work, has started running and to this day continues to run an NWP application on AWS. It's a program we call Cirrus. The success of Cirrus relies on Maxar being able to run, in this case, FV3, faster than NOAA does because our customers are interested in having a little bit more lead time so that they can make decisions. I've got actually a picture there on the right I've got our run on the top and then the NCEP one on the bottom. I just plucked these out on Monday. They're, they're valid right about now. Well, in order to actually be able to run this uh, FE3 model at the speed we wanted to, and uh, not have to go out and buy ourselves our own supercomputer, uh, we decided to work with AWS to design and build a cloud computing environment that was as cost effective and scalable as we could. Uh, we certainly made use of EC2 instances those would be like the nodes themselves, parallel cluster to get things going, the elastic fabric adapter, EFA, to connect things together, FSx and Luster and other tools to basically build ourselves in the cloud a high-performance computing cluster every day. Um, the initial effort to make this all go, again, about a year ago, was first to go, and again, this was a year ago and things have advanced since then, go to the NSAP VLAB repository for the GFS FV3, uh, recompile the code, tend to any issues that we found, and the other little things like drive types. Uh, rework the NCEP workflow so that it would be more hardware agnostic, things with directories, paths, external libraries. And then for ourselves, discern the best model layout for our AWS cl uh, cloud hardware, which was 36 cores per node. That's different than what um, what's on the NCO supercomputer. So we did have to adjust a little bit. Uh, the entire workflow, from spinning up the cluster to spinning it down has become automated. The, the cores themselves, the volumes, the disk space are all reallocated each day. I mean, we don't spin up a cluster and just leave it there for all time. If the model takes an hour to run, we only have the cluster for one hour. The execution of the workflow is automated using a series of step and lambda functions. We don't like have to log on to something to make it go. It's launched automatically daily. Um, we can monitor it, of course, but we don't have to. Uh, CloudFormation builds the stacks. We use code pipeline if we ever have uh, something we want to change, either in the workflow or maybe we recompile the code. Um, and all of this, we mostly did it ourselves. We absolutely had contributions from the folks at Amazon AWS Professional Services. This is effectively, you know, we do run this every day, and this is the sequence of events that leads to the running. Uh, we, there's a trigger, which is basically like a, a timer, a cron, if you will, that says it is time to make the cluster, which it then does so that the cluster is up and ready in place once the input files for FV3 are available on the NOAA uh, FTP or Nomad sites. Um, actually, their arrival is a second trigger that says, oh, the data is there, let us go get it, uh, do what we need to do with it. And so the cluster is ready 
and the initial condition files are ready at the same time. We launch the run. It does what it does. We get notifications, emails, um, even notes into our own Slack channels saying how things are going or that they have finished. And then even the process to delete the cluster when we're done is automated. So that is very convenient because, you know, once you're done, you want to stop it because you pay for compute by the minute. So no reason to have it when you don't want it. This is the setup that we've got. We've basically got one big master node, large memory, large number of compute cores that not only manages to get things going as a master node for the run, but does the post-processing. We've got this 14 terabyte file system uh, stuck onto it to capture all of those NEMS.io files uh, and the post-processed GRIB files that result from running FV3. A whole collection of worker nodes um, in the order of hundreds, it's connected using that elastic fabric adapter, 100 gigabytes per second. And this is the one that we found that worked best for us, the one that we spin up every day, spin down when it's completed. We actually run two of them, one in the Eastern United States, one in the West, so that if for some reason one or the two of them encounter some sort of um, issue, the other one carries on as a nice hot backup. Now, what I just spoke of was the configuration that worked the best for us to deliver the model in a timely fashion to our customers. But given the breadth of the, the community on this, uh, listening to me presently, and just for our own interest, we ran 37 different configurations. Um, there's a little box off to the right of my uh, bullet points that sort of shows if you were to spin up a cluster, the sort of things that you would include to get it going. We tried a number of different combinations of compute cores from 252 to over 10,000. We tried both the nodes that are connected using the fast EFA and then ones that are not that just use TCP. All of them had that same 14 terabyte uh, file system attached to them. This is just some results. I mean, the, to go through our entire case study would be a talk in its own. And so I'm not going to do that. But you know, we ran the, the 252 number of cores is on the far left. The ones that are in the tens of thousands are on the right. You can see actually we can run a full 16 day uh, C768 resolution. We can actually do it as you might do in production in under an hour. Um, but right. we did learn, uh, yes, two we minutes ago. Two minutes and we and can't there. really see the, we can't really see the, 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 the lower bottom of your slides. So it was difficult to see where the axis should be. Oh no, I'm very sorry about that. Um, the axis on the bottom going from left to right is effectively number of compute cores uh, from 256 on the left to the tens of thousands on the right. So sorry about that. I did not know that I was chopped off on the bottom. But anyway, I'll, I'll carry on since there's two minutes to go. Um, and so from this, we learned you know, the trade-offs between MPI and OMP that you know, as you scale the higher core counts, the amount of time you spend doing things like communication increases. And so part of what I am presenting just then and in general, we did set up a, a configuration to run FE3 that was good for us, but we realized fairly early on that this could be a value to others, all those different configurations. So we've been trying to get the word out, HPC articles, uh, our own blog, um, AWS published a case study, um, Stefan presented that a, a while back. Um, and most recently, I, I think just today it was announced that we wanted the AWS award for the best HPC solution for the public sector. I mean, NOAA is the public sector. And so it's just an acknowledgement that what we've done has utility to folks other than ourselves. Um, we are gonna take on the ensemble. That's supposed to upgrade in September. It'll just present a new set of challenges because we'll be running the model 31 times at a lower resolution. And the cloud with the scalability is not bad for that. So this is the final slide. For over a year, we've been running FE3 on the cloud uh, day after day. We do get our CI CD achieved from code pipeline. So if we make any changes, either to the workflow or any of the components, we're able to get that going into our production system fairly quickly. Um, it is true that when you run in the cloud, you can get these 10,000 core counts. So you that's a greater number than NCEP, uh, NCO has to offer. Uh, and, and you don't actually have to buy them all, they're just there, you, mean you just have to go out and get them. Uh, AWS resources and tools, I mean, they really do let you cost for what you want to do in terms of, I have this much money, I need these many cores, and you can work with that. We, 
as the bottom point says, there's really a range of values that you can run over in AWS without having to go get a supercomputer, without having to wait in the queue. We did do this to find a setup that was best for us, but for others, it could be different. It's certainly possible that folks that are um, listening to me right now can use the cloud to do simulations using resources that match your budget and your scope. And effectively, that if you use the cloud, all of us that are doing experiments with UFS can get just the compute they need for the work that they want to do. Uh, stop with that and take questions if there is time to do so. Yes, thank you. There are quite a few questions. We have time for one or two or something like that. Um, Tina, okay. Uh, take care of that, please. Okay, so uh, the first one came in on uh, in the chat and it says, in terms of cost effectiveness, have you looked at the 48 core nodes yet to reduce communication between nodes? The answer to that question is absolutely yes. We have indeed uh, taken a look at that. Um, I don't know if I'm at liberty to say the numbers, but we've definitely kept our eye on the 48. Uh, you know what, with that, um, because I, I myself am a little bit new to Maxar, I invite Stefan, is there anything we can say about that or is it just too new, uh, the results to make any comments on that question? Can you guys hear me? I yes, do, Stefan. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I just was muted doubly, so. Um, so the, the 48 core uh, machines on AWS uh, actually do not have uh, enhanced EFA interconnect. So even though that their capacity could be there to be using it and to decrease the node-to-node uh, um, uh, -node communication, the, the interconnect is kind of the detriment there, um, being either only 25 gigabits per second or 20, depending on which 48 core set you, you look at. Um, I think there is the availability of possibly hooking up EFA to some of these, but right now um, it's really the looking for the instance types that have EFA and the 100 gigabit interconnects that are ideal, at least for FV3. All right, thanks. Um, I think we need to keep going. Um, I just heard that Kevin joined us. Kevin, welcome. Would you be able to give your presentation right away? Hi, yes, I'm all ready to go. Thank you for uh, your flexibility. Um, I think I just need to go and uh, probably um, find a screen share button or something. Um, present, present now, now button go. on the right. There we go. There, there's a lot more questions on, um, on Slack as well. Uh, Brian, if you have time to uh, log on and answer any of those. Oh, I most definitely will do so. Okay. All right, so. The next speaker is Kevin Jorgensen from um, AWS speaking about HPC and Amazon Web Services. Kevin, the floor is, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. I've been with Amazon about uh, five to six years working with researchers in many fields, but especially with people doing weather and climate research. And some of you may know me in that capacity. Um, you already heard a, a detailed um, case study about running FE3 on AWS just now from, uh, from the folks from Maxar. And so let me show you a few slides to place, that, uh, to place that in a broader context and show you that that is not an anomaly, but that it is representative of the state of the art of numerical weather prediction in the cloud today. Uh, an example that we worked on earlier this year was with a meteorological institute at the far end of the globe. You might be able to guess which one. Um, that had a, um, a global forecast they have to run every day, operational work, 2,500 cores, but it's capacity constrained, and wanted to establish whether it was possible to, to use AWS as a place to run the same forecasts in an operational way. Uh, we tested it out and found that, indeed, using 2,500 core cluster on AWS, you can produce the operational forecast in about the same time as you can do it on-premise, pretty much exactly the same. Having proven that, we wondered, well, how, how much further can you go? What if you used twice as big a cluster? Well, you saw a speed up on both ends, on AWS and on-premise, at about the right extent. This one on-premise was very slightly faster, but you know, pretty much the same. And then we said, well, could we make the forecast actually twice as fast as they can do it on-premise today? And it turned out that, yes, you could do that on AWS. You could cut uh, um, 48 minutes down to 24 by using about 7,000 cores for your unified model job. It was not possible to test it on-premise because they ran out of cores and they couldn't keep up to that, uh, that part on the scaling curve. 
And so, you know, we got these kind of curves that are similar to what Max was showing just now, uh, where you see how well, uh, how much speed up you can get for your application as you go to larger cluster sizes, as you throw more cores at the problem. Or alternatively, you say, within what turnaround time do I need the results? And if necessary, am I willing to spend a little more to get it faster? Because, you know, there happens to be some kind of urgent situation, right? Um, we use the same ingredients as what Max, Max are used for their studies, although in a slightly more vanilla, slightly more basic configuration. So we have this, the C5N Skylake servers with the uh, Amazon HPC interconnect that has 100 gigabits uh, bandwidth and, and lower latency, not quite at the infinity band level, but plenty low to run these jobs. We had a small luster file system attached to that for, uh, for storage and I.O. And then we used again, the vanilla AWS parallel cluster tool to set up the cluster and basically present this HPC cap capability to any user within about uh, 10 minutes uh, of, of a request, at which point the user could log in and kick off as many jobs as, as are needed without, without a queue. And, um, you know, results like that exists for various codes and in various fields. I thought I would flash just a few on the screen. Doing work with uh, UCAR at this point, where we're testing uh, new WARF benchmarks, and uh, so far we are able to match the Cheyenne performance up to about 14,000 cores. Uh, we've run MPASS with customers at uh, three to 4,000 cores, uh, Geoschem at over 1,000 cores, and uh, NAFGEM at uh, something like 1,500 cores or so. I believe uh, those are the last ones I had here. Finally, on, on the FE3 core, actually, we started doing work on this uh, about a year and a half or two years ago with the Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation, which will be familiar to many of you. And they took NOAA's daily high-resolution uh, global forecast and replicated it on the cloud at that time and proved it was possible to uh, match NOAA's on-premise turnaround time with a 1,700-core cluster on AWS. That was the original work, and then, as you saw just, uh, just now, Mexar has taken that an order of magnitude faster by, by pushing the cloud uh, beyond just, just matching the existing uh, NOAA infrastructure. Um, that should give you, uh, and, and by the way, the Joint Center Satellite Simulation is also uh, a great place to go look if you wonder how um, operational people in the, uh, in the uh, field of weather have dealt with data assimilation on the cloud, serverless computing, machine learning, um, in, uh, continuous integration and development and whatnot. Um, these are people that you could go to and, and ask for, uh, for, uh, for lessons on how to do this because they, um, they have the experience. Um, at this point, I want to ask my colleague Zach if he's here to jump in and take a couple minutes just talking about the data side of things because you don't do HPC in a vacuum. Um, Zach, yeah. are you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Me. yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so I just want to talk briefly about the AWS Public Dataset Program. Um, I think some of you may have heard this before. Um, but if not, it is a program that covers the cost of storage for publicly available high value cloud optimized data sets. And so we're, what we're really trying to do here is work with data providers who seek to democratize access to their data um, to make it av available for analysis both on and off AWS. Uh, we're also looking to help data providers innovate around the formats for their data sets so that they can develop new cloud native techniques and formats for their data for uh, storing it and making it easier to work with for the community. Um, so some of these things are, you know, cloud-optimized GeoTIFF and ZAR. Uh, we're also working to encourage the development of communities that benefit from access to these shared data sets. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple slides. But this is really, you know, we're trying to help the community as a whole grow as well uh, by providing a place for them to be able to share their data and to, to carry out some of these works. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide, Kevin. And so... You have about two minutes, Zach. Thanks. So our uh, primary home where we list all of our data sets is called the Registry of Open Data on AWS. You can find it at registry.opendata.aws. Here we have a variety of observation and simulation data sets. Uh, you'll notice there are a lot of data sets here from NOAA. We're partnered with NOAA and uh, NOAA's big data project. And so from that, we get a lot of data, including uh, all of the Nextrad archive, the Go 16 and 17. Uh, we have some other data sets uh, coming in from around the world of radar data. Uh, that you'll see soon. We have the GFS. We have uh, some of the parallel runs of GFS too, so you can more easily intercompare those. We have all of the National Water Model Archive and the real-time runs. 
Uh, so we're open to hosting a lot of data sets here. The partnership with NOAA enables us to host many of the data sets. I know uh, a couple talks ago, there was some interest in hosting some of the data for the input for the regression tests and things like that. Um, if that's a need that we can address, um, please reach out. I think we can uh, help with that as well. Uh, so these are sort of all the data that's available. Then finally, if you go to the next slide, Kevin, we can talk a little bit about how people are actually using these data. And so one of those is through the Pangeo project. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's just pangeo.io is their website. You can go check it out. But really what they're trying to do is to figure out how do we help people work with the data and really by working with the data, they want people to be able to work with very large data sets, think petabyte scale data sets without having to copy all of the data to their on-premise HPC or their on-premise compute cluster by doing all of that analysis in the cloud. Uh, and so really what happens here is you see in the Pangeo, they use Jupyter Hub. So each user spins up a Jupyter notebook and then that's backed by Dask and X-Array. So they're backed by a compute cluster and then they can access all of the data on the cloud. Uh, this is really a very cool project. Um, they're a very open community. They're doing a lot of work in uh, the earth sciences and ocean and atmosphere. They're doing a lot of work in machine learning. I would encourage you to check them out and participate in their meetings uh, if you have the opportunity. Uh, and with that, I'll say uh, thanks. I don't think I have anything else, Kevin. Uh, no, I think we stayed within time. That's uh, well done. We're usually both quite talkative. We'd be happy to take some questions. Yeah, great. Thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, there is quite a bit of a discussion going on. Um, Lots about details with which processors, IMD, Intel, and so I think this is best to be answered in that in that chat. So I think in the interest of time, but I think there is a huge interest in staging the, the regression test data on AWS. So we should definitely come back to to discussing that. All right. Well, thanks very much. So if you could please unshare your screen so that the next speaker can um, get ready. So our next speaker is Mark Cheesman, and he will be talking about um, performance and portability, creating efficient Docker containers of the global FV3 GFS. Mark, are you ready? Uh, yes, yeah, I'm just. Okay. Okay, I can see you. And you can see me, can you see me? Awesome. Yeah, cool. Okay, Mark, take it from there. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, so I'm Mark Giesman. I'm a scientific programmer here at Vulcan. I'm going to talk a little bit about our work with FEV GFS and more specifically how we're using Docker. Um, so I'm part of the new climate modeling group that formed about a little over a year ago. Um, we have two teams, uh, 15 people in total based here in Seattle and on the East Coast over in Princeton. Um, we have two actual teams inside the group. We have one focusing on a domain-specific language implementation, and this group is being led by Oliver Fuhr, and that's the group I'm in. Our mission goal is to improve FV3 GFS at the global storm resolving uh, resolutions. And then we also have a team focused on machine learning who's being led by Chris Breverton, and their focus is improving subgrid cloud and precipitation parameterizations using different ML models. So just to give you an idea of what we're doing in my team, uh, here's the 100,000 foot view. We're taking the beloved Fortran code. We're running some tests to get some understanding of what's happening and performance on different platforms. One of those platforms is a Cray supercomputer at the Swiss uh, National Supercomputing Center at Kolpis Um, We're also undergoing a refactoring process where we're rewriting the Fortran code into our DSL framework. Now, one component of that framework is a Python front end where we translate the Fortran into a stencil-like dialect. Now, Ria is gonna talk a little bit more about this in the next talk, so I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, then we'll have a, a middle layer, which includes an optimizing compiler type tool, which takes that, those stencils and translate them into uh, low level uh, code, which you can run on like multi-core CPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, and so forth. And then at the end of the refactoring project, we're gonna do a demonstration simulation. This will be a high resolution, one, two kilometer horizontal resolution run addressing some sort of scientific uh, problem, more likely uh, precipitation bias. And we're gonna be using Docker in a number of uh, components of this workflow. 
So, you know, why use Docker? Well, you know, I think we've all been there. You know, it's a real pain just installing the same packages over and over on different platforms. You need to know where all the compilers and libraries are, or you log into the machine, it doesn't have the exact version of the Intel compilers that you need to run reliably. Um, Docker allows you to get past that. Um, if you're using Python, Python has its own challenges with lots of packages. So our, one of our images uses 28 individual packages. Um, so I like the fact that I can build the image on my laptop and then I can deploy it to Google Cloud for testing or I can deploy it to a Cray supercomputer for performance testing. Um, you will need to know a little bit of uh, performance uh, specific, uh, platform specific information about running the container but the additional amount of information you need to know is minimal. And a lot of it uses information that you'll need to know to run on that platform anyway. So uh, the real question that does still come up nowadays, even though there's been a lot of talk about this is, you know, Docker is slow, right? You know, we shouldn't be using it for HPC, but that's not really the case. It hasn't been for a while now. You can get bare metal performance. Um, you can get good MPI support here on the right. I have uh, runs using bare metal and container uh, versions of FV3 running in a C768 configuration. These are both using the Intel compiler, uh, compiled uh, binaries. I um, do have to say that they are running slightly different configurations to the machine because of allocations. And so that explains a little bit of the performance difference. So a little, little asterisk there. Um, but the main important takeaway is that as you increase the scalability, the performance pretty much levels out. So we're not hitting a major roadblock and in running inside a container. And as I mentioned, uh, one of the platforms we're targeting is the Cray Supercomputer at the Swiss uh, Supercomputing Center. They have a, a number of tools that you can use to deploy uh, the Docker containers. A uh, Ceres, which is the uh, Successor to Sh Shifter, you may have, may have heard of that tool, and Singularity are the two main tools. Uh, there, are, there is a got you when you want to get the best MPI performance in using these tools. You do have a restriction on the MPI version and type that you can use. So for the Cray, you have to use an MPitch implementation for MPI. And you you also limited to a certain version of that, and that depends on the actual Cray software installed on, on your on your machine. So for CSCS, it's the 3.1 series of MPitch that we're limit, limited to. Now, if you're not using the the proper MPI, it will affect your performance, and that's what I'm showing here on the right. When you have the right performance, uh, the right MPI implementation and version, your MPI calls are basically yanked out and replaced with low level Cray optimized MPI calls. And you get beautiful scaling like the blue bar show here. When you don't have that, you know, you use maybe a slightly incorrect version of, of MPitch. It'll still run, but you won't get those Cray optimized calls. So your scalability will stagnate here at about, you know, 768 cores. So you have to be careful about that. And sometimes it won't even run at all if it's too big of a difference. So if, Open MPI versus MPitch, for instance. Um, you can use the different compilers, obviously. Um, I know there's a lot of experience using Intel for creating the binaries for FE3 GFS. Uh, we can run with both GNU and Intel. I've just took two examples here of GNU 8 and Intel to the Docker containers we use. Intel does have a clear performance gain. Um, there are a couple issues of using Intel compilers. The licensing isn't so much an issue right now. We're using the free one API HPC toolkit images. Um, if you do use those images, they are a bit large, around four and a half to five gigs. So if you're adding a lot of stuff to your images, um, you might be, you know, moving a really large container back and forth. So uh, just Sorry, keep that. Two minutes mind. left. Okay. Um, the latest Intel MPI that comes with those images aren't uh, compatible to Cray Network, so you'll still have to build your own version of MPI. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, if you don't know about Docker Build, build Kit, I use it all the time for my builds, uh, for standalone builds and for testing. Um, it allows you to do parallel builds at the same time so that I can have different stages of my code being built concurrently. Um, it also makes the images smaller. So here, I got a small schematic on the side. You know, when I build my FE3 free GFS, I can do my MPI build and my IO build concurrently. When they finish, I build the prerequisite libraries, 
and then when they finish, I, fi I build a final FE3 FE GFS binary. Now, depending on the platform and the amount of prerequisites I need to build, I could save up to 30 minutes to, using this approach. And it also keeps my final image a little bit smaller. So basically uh, wrapping up, uh, so Docker containers are a viable deployment choice for FE3 GFS. I know there are tools to allow development uh, and deployment on today's supercomputers, Ceres and uh, Singularity. You can use the same Docker container in different platforms. That's what we use right now every day. I didn't talk about CI, but we, we integrate these Docker containers into our CI's Jenkins and Circle CI testing. Um, we'll be releasing public versions of, of our Docker containers in the near future, including the Docker files, multiple compiler support, and Cray ready versions. And a big thanks to our collaborators, particularly CSCS, for giving us time to run on this diet, and GFDL for helping us set up simulations. And with that, uh, I can take some questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, yeah, there are some questions. Tina, your turn. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. So the first one by Lou Wicker. Is there a reason Singularity is not used or just started in living with Docker? Um, so we've used Singularity and Ceres for our testing on the Cray. Um, there's no real big uh, use, uh, a big um, reason for one over the other. Um, I know Ceres is actually being developed at CSCS. So if we have problems with performance, we can actually talk to the developers directly. And they've been very um, responsive to any, any questions and comments uh, we have. Um, but you know, uh, we use Singularity, for instance, on Google Cloud. Uh, so for my Google Cloud instances, I almost use uh, Singularity exclusively. We have time for one more question. Okay, so this is by Brian Dobbins. It says, Mark, do you run with one container instance per node with threads inside the node or 36 ranks per node each running? the container. If the latter, I assume it's the MPI-CH ABI layer using the Cray MPI under the hood that gives good memory, same node performance. Uh, there, there's, I'll, I'll stop there. There's more questions. Yeah, yeah, so I, I know he's doing. So yes, so I am using, uh, I'm using the uh, native approach where you have multiple images. Um, you, you have one image uh, per compute node. And then uh, when you have the proper MPI built, uh, with ABI compatibility, uh, your MPI calls will be automatically recognized and replaced by the Cray MPI daemon running on the host. And that's how you get the best performance, uh, particularly for collective uh, communications. Uh, you guys in FEGFS do have configurations where you can limit the amount of use of collectives and use single send receives. And that'll help when you're not using the optimized network. I didn't have time to talk about any of that, but um, the short answer is yes, I'm using, I'm using that to get the best performance out of the Cray hardware and software stack. Awesome, thank you. So the next talk and the last talk of this session is by one of your colleagues, Mark, I think it's by Ria on separating physics and performance using Python to implement a fast and maintainable FP3 die core. Ria, are you ready to go? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, just a second, let me press present. And all right, can everyone see my screen? Yep, beautiful. All right, uh, thank you so much. Um, hi, I, I work with the last speaker, Mark Cheeseman at Vulcan. So you've already been introduced to our effort to run FE3 climate simulations at high resolution. Uh, Mark discussed performance and running the model using a Docker container, and I'm going to elaborate on the code we run uh, using that approach. Um, I'm going to share how we wrote the FE3 dynamical core in a way that can be fast on multiple hardware architectures and easy to maintain. Um, so in order to run FE3 at high resolution globally, uh, we need to make use of supercomputers. We just, we just need to. Uh, but modern supercomputers are mainly getting more powerful uh, over time using graphics processing units or GPUs, um, which imp improve performance mainly by increasing the parallelism that exists rather than uh, CPU clock speed. Uh, we know FE3 is very fast, um, it's been highly optimized, um, but for CPUs, 
Um, it's possible to rewrite FE3 to run efficiently on GPUs, um, but then that implementation is then slow on CPUs. So to have a model that works well on both, you can write complicated code that's really hard to read and maintain, or you can commit to maintaining two different versions, um, but those approaches are somewhat unmanageable and they're not gonna help you run FE3 and whatever the next hardware architecture advancement happens to be. So our approach is to separate the expression of the numerical operations uh, from the hardware specific optimizations. So uh, to make a model that can run fast on multiple platforms um, and also uh, make for a simpler front end code base. Um, so to achieve this uh, domain specific language or DSL can be really useful. Um, a DSL is just a programming language uh, that is tailored to a specific problem like TensorFlow for uh, machine learning problems. Um, by restricting the number of concepts we need to need to be represented, we can make the things we want to work well, work extremely well. Um, so we make use of a DSL targeted at weather and climate. Um, Grid Tools provides a useful framework of libraries in this area, so uh, we, didn't, we don't really need to start from scratch as we build our DSL. So consider a simplified 2D Laplacian example. A model will typically take the discretized form of this equation, um, and write it directly, explicitly choosing the loop order over dimensions. Um, with our particular DSL, instead we get to express the algorithm with a single line, with the lop here. That is a functional equation that we understand, and we rely on the DSL to automatically generate optimized lower level code that is best suited for whatever platform it's running on. Um, success with this approach has been demonstrated by other groups. Um, there was a rewrite of the Cosmo model, um, that was very successful in this, but um, there's been difficulty in gaining widespread adoption of this approach, similarly partly from the fact that C++ as a front-end language is not that appealing, it's not super common in the atmospheric scientist community, and there's somewhat of a barrier uh, to using it. So we've decided to use an open source project, Grid Tools for Python, or GT4Py, uh, that provides a Python interface to our DSL. Python has a growing and strong presence in the atmospheric science community. And by itself, a Python model would be way too slow. Uh, but as an interface to a tool that generates fast code, um, it's really useful. Um, I also want to mention our group is actively contributing to a project called Dawn, which will optimize the code that comes from GT4Py before generating the hardware-specific compiled code. So here's a concrete example of what a function in the FE3 Fortran code looks like after porting it to GT4Py. On the Fortran side, we explicitly write uh, triply nested loops over the horizontal and vertical dimensions, and we decide which one we want to parallelize over with OMP statements. When expressed in GT4Py, the model developer doesn't decide what order would be optimal, but instead lets the compiler toolchain choose it based on the platform it's running on. Um, the bounds of the loop um, are, are expressed with a, a simple call to the stencil function, the compute origin and compute domain, just where do you start, how far in the array do you uh, calculate. And then we don't need to explicitly allocate temporary storages. Seen in the purple text, fx and fy are temporaries that we let the compiler decide how to allocate and manage. And perhaps one of the most impactful features for FE3, uh, we get to define reusable functions as seen with del x and del y here. When we call small subroutines in Fortran, we typically, typically experience a performance hit. But in this language, we can reuse the code as much as we want, and the DSL will do the work of inlining these functions where they belong, so you can still get speed um, in generated code. So we no longer need to express the same math in multiple, multiple places all over the code. Uh, this allows for great volume of code reduction and um, codes that's easier to use abstraction. So uh, when we started the port of the FE3 dynamical core to use GT4Py, um, we first developed a testing framework to ensure our new code doesn't contain bugs and that when the code is generated for different architectures, it still gets the right answer. We extended an open source tool called Serial Box that makes saving out the data at intermediate stages of the Fortran model easy. 
we then translate small pieces of the dynamical core at a time so that when a mismatch is found for the dynamical core, we can identify where it's coming from. Here, oh, thank you so much. Um, here on the Fortran side, uh, around the function we want to port, pgradc, all we do is add comments. Um, and when the Fortran model is running in its normal execution mode, those are ignored. When we compile with serialization turned on, those get transformed into live code that will actively save our data. Then on the Python side, um, we can use the serial box Python library to read this data, run our Python code, and then compare the outputs. Um, this has been really powerful in catching little bugs that just naturally happen when you, when you change from one code base to another. Um, so this has really enabled us um, to get an accurate port of the dynamical core. Um, so where we are now, we've successfully uh, ported and have passing in CI about 770 unit computations, and then also the full dynamical core um, against the Fortran reference. Um, and additionally, students taking a course at ETH Zurich, uh, we spun them up on GT4 Pi, and very quickly they figured out how to use it, and they ported uh, two physics parameterizations um, and had them validating very quickly. So this gave us confidence that this approach is really useful for the community. Um, there's some challenges. Uh, like some of the FE3 algorithms just have large error growth. So that made um, aggregating multiple functions and still getting validating answers a bit challenging. Um, and additionally, the feature of FE3 that is great for a lot of things, speed being one of them, the, the cube sphere geometry um, didn't, doesn't fit naturally with the model of the DSL, um, but uh, we are adding a feature to make that also be efficient. So I, here's just a representation of the dynamical core. I'm just showing in purple uh, parts of the code that were computed over the horizontal with outer loops over the vertical. And then there's also column calculations where the outer loop is in J. Um, and just to say that when we ported these, all of these become 3D operations that the compiler decides how to best run. So in summary, um, we have an FE3 dynamical core written in Python that will be able to run efficiently on both CPUs and GPUs. Um, we are currently improving some features, um, working on the back end, and we're gearing up to run high resolution simulations. Um, I wanna give a thanks to all of our collaborating partners with, you know, without them, we'd have to be a lot <laughs> further behind than we are right now. And um, I just wanna indicate, we are really open to sharing and collaborating with people. So please contact us if this interests you at all, because it's, it's pretty exciting and fun stuff to work on. And thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. So there are a couple of questions, Tina. The first one is from Mark Govett. It says, how do you handle debugging when the user code, Python, is so different from the compiled code? Mm, that's a good question. So, well, there's there's different layers of debugging. There's um, there's there's debugging with the uh, like in that like you can run the DSL with a fort in the Fortran only mode basically, and so you can debug just in Fortran itself. When the error is stemming from the compiled code, that is that is harder. Um, and our compiler team has added some infrastructure around. Um, uh, automatically creating little unit tests um, that do a similar thing where they serialize input and output data so that when they're on that lower level, they don't have to keep coming back out to Python. It is it is really challenging, yeah, when you have a multi-layered system to <laughs> debug. I would say that, it, yeah, that's another challenging feature of this, but there are ways to, to create infrastructure that enables you to, to be effective. Okay, well, I think we have to stop here. I want to thank all the speakers of this session. It was really exciting and uh, 